He is one of the most infamous terrorists in American history, a math genius turned relentless criminal, responsible for a series of bombings that lasted nearly two decades. Ted Kaczynski, known as the Unabomber, lived in isolation in the forests of Montana, crafting an identity few could ever imagine. His manifesto challenged modern society and its technologies, sparking intense debate. Today, we'll dive into the life of this enigmatic figure and explore his motivations. Make sure to hit that like button and turn on notifications so you don't miss anything. Ted was born on May 22, 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. The son of Wanda Dombeck and Theodore Richard Kaczynski, he grew up in a household that highly valued education. His mother dedicated herself to the home and raising the children, while his father, who owned a small food factory, provided financial stability for the family. To the neighbors, the Kaczynskis were a friendly couple, always sacrificing everything for their kids. Ted attended Sherman School in Chicago, but after his brother David was born, the family moved to the suburbs of Illinois, where Ted enrolled in Evergreen Park. At school, he was seen as a bright but introverted boy with a good circle of friends. His intelligence impressed teachers, leading to him taking an IQ test. The average IQ in the United States is 98, and at just 10 years old, Ted scored an astonishing 167, marking him as a genius. Because of this, Ted skipped the sixth grade. Academically, he excelled, but this advancement ended up isolating him from his peers. With the age gap, Ted began to face bullying, and coupled with his shyness, he withdrew socially. The boy who once loved staying home studying math and chemistry now retreated completely into his books. At 16, Ted was accepted into the prestigious Harvard University on a scholarship. There, he excelled in mathematics, graduating with the highest average in his class at age 20. But it was during his sophomore year that a controversial event occurred. Ted participated in a psychological study involving emotional manipulation. He and other students wrote essays about their dreams and ambitions, and during the sessions, a stranger used these essays to humiliate and insult them while their reactions were monitored. This study, which lasted three years, remains a topic of debate regarding its potential impact on his mind. The experiment Ted Kaczynski participated in at Harvard appeared to aim at testing whether constant and aggressive confrontation of ideas could influence a person's choices and mindset, even against their will. This led many to view the study as a form of mind control. Ted spent 200 hours involved in this experiment but always claimed it had no significant impact on his life. However, this issue was later used by his defense suggesting that his actions and behaviors may have been influenced by the study. What truly fueled the theories about this study being a form of mind control was its lead psychologist, Henry Murray. During World War II, Murray worked for an intelligence agency that would become the foundation of the CIA, established in 1947. This ties into one of the most famous conspiracy theories, MKUltra. This program, which became public in 1975, involved illegal experiments on human subjects without their consent, aiming to discover techniques for mind control and interrogation. Among the methods used were psychological and physical torture, administration of high doses of psychoactive drugs like LSD, as well as shock treatment, hypnosis, sleep deprivation, and other forms of torture. MK Ultra began in 1953 and was terminated in 1973. Documents related to the program were destroyed, but some parts are still available online. The theory is that MK Ultra was a continuation of the experiments conducted by Nazis during the war, and some believe that despite being officially discontinued, the studies and experiments never truly stopped. Ted Kaczynski is considered one of many criminals who, according to theories, may have been a victim of MKUltra, with Henry Murray identified as the link between the Harvard experiment and the controversial CIA program. None of this has ever been proven. And again, according to Ted himself, the Harvard study did not influence his life. After three years in this experiment, he graduated in 1962 and continued his studies at the University of Michigan, where he earned both his master's and doctoral degrees, even publishing a paper that solved a previously unsolvable equation. His academic achievements led to multiple job offers from various universities. However, in 1966, something curious marked Ted's life. 
He began to have fantasies about becoming a woman. He even scheduled an appointment with a psychiatrist to discuss the possibility of gender transition surgery, but changed his mind while waiting. Instead of discussing his fantasies, he talked to the psychiatrist about his depression. Later, he confessed to having thought about killing the professional to keep his fantasies a secret. This desire for bodily change caused Ted great distress, and he ended up directing his anger and frustration at the psychiatrist. Due to these personal dilemmas, he never married or dated, and seemingly had no intimate encounters throughout his life. At 25, Ted began working as a teaching assistant at the University of California, Berkeley. The following year, he became a full professor. He was described as a poor educator, refusing to answer questions and merely reading from the textbook. During this time, Ted increasingly avoided contact with others, appearing disturbed by their presence. For no apparent reason, he left his teaching position on June 30, 1969, and returned to his parents' home in Illinois. In 1971, Ted decided to withdraw from civilization. He and his brother built a small cabin in a remote area not far from Lincoln, Montana, where Ted moved to live without electricity or running water. His goal was to create a small farm and become self-sufficient in nature, eventually hunting small animals. Generally, above-average intelligence is accompanied by social isolation and odd behaviors. It seemed Ted had given up on society. During this transition, he survived with help from his parents and various jobs, which didn't last long. One was with his brother's company, which fired him after he posted an inappropriate message on the bulletin board. Now living alone in the wilderness, Ted received frequent visits from his father, exchanged letters with his brother, and used a bicycle to go into town on rare occasions. According to the town librarian, Ted spent hours with his head buried in books on philosophy, sociology, and politics, always choosing to read the works in their original language. Ted was already surviving without his parents' support when he was confronted by the advance of society. He discovered that some machines were operating nearby and at night, sabotage several of them to disrupt or delay their operations. This was his first attack on society as he had claimed to be against technology for a long time. During this period, he found another small cabin not far from his own. With an ax, he opened one of the walls, vandalized the place, defecated in the bathtub, and fled. His goal was likely to scare people away so he could remain isolated, which, unfortunately for him, did not happen. Soon after, the police knocked on his door to ask if he had seen anything unusual. Ted said no, and the officers left. The owners of the vandalized cabin were a couple who quickly described Ted as peaceful, removing him from the suspect list. This was the first contact police had with him, even before the first bomb exploded. In 1983, one day, Ted woke up to the sounds of motorcycles. A group of people was using the area for recreational activities, but in Ted's view, they were simply corrupting his silence. With the constant noise from passing planes, he became convinced that he would never escape civilization. Frustrated, he rode his bike to a distant mountain near a waterfall, which he deemed perfect and visited occasionally. However, one day he arrived to find a newly constructed road. According to Kaczynski, it was at that moment he gave up on fleeing. Escaping what he called the system seemed practically impossible. If you're enjoying the story, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. This way, you'll receive more content like this and help us continue bringing incredible stories to you. Ted reached a breaking point. He realized that instead of trying to escape the system, he should fight against it. In an interview after his arrest, Ted spoke about a moment that profoundly affected him. I returned to that flat area at the top of the mountain, and when I got there, I found that they had built a road right through it. You have no idea how upset I was. It was from this moment that he decided to abandon the idea of isolating himself in nature and began to focus on how to combat what he saw as an oppressive system. While nurturing this growing anger, Ted received news that further deteriorated his mental state. In 1990, when Ted was 48, his father was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. On October 2nd of that year, his father took his own life with a gunshot to the head. This traumatic event deeply shook Ted cutting one of his few remaining ties. Alone and filled with hatred, he set out for revenge. In the following months, Ted began to teach himself how to make homemade bombs. He designed various types of devices, 
testing them until he found the most effective model for his objectives. His targets were institutions and individuals he believed represented the technological and industrial system he despised. Ted felt that destroying society would be less painful than living in the future he envisioned, and he was determined to cause as much damage as possible. This mindset becomes even clearer in his manifesto, which we will discuss later. On May 25, 1978, his first attack occurred when a package arrived at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. The package was addressed to Professor Buckley Christ, but since he wasn't expecting any returns, he believed it was a mistake. Without thinking much, he handed the package to University Police Officer Terry Marker, who jokingly said it could be a bomb. Unfortunately, he was right. As soon as the package was opened, it exploded. Terry sustained cuts and burns, but survived with minor injuries. The police launched an investigation, but were unable to identify the culprit. However, the following year, a second package arrived at the same address on May 9, 1979. This time, it exploded in the hands of student John Harris, who fortunately also suffered only minor injuries. The police noticed a troubling pattern and feared more attacks were imminent. On November 15, 1979, American Airlines Flight 444, departing from Chicago to Washington, became the scene of another explosion. During the flight, a bomb detonated, causing smoke inhalation for 12 passengers, but miraculously, no one died. The plane did not sustain serious damage, and the pilot managed to land safely. The airline never managed to explain how that device made it on board. The forensic team investigating the case began to find something intriguing about the bombs. Some components had the initials FC engraved on them. These initials referred to the Freedom Club, a name created by Ted Kaczynski to give the impression that he was part of an organized group. However, FBI investigations found no evidence of anyone else involved in the attacks. Over 17 years, Ted Kaczynski planted 16 bombs through the mail or left them in strategic locations. Of these 16, only two were disarmed in time by the police, while all the others exploded. These attacks resulted in 23 injuries and three fatalities. The first victim was Hugh Scotton, the owner of a computer store, who died in Sacramento, California. Next was Thomas Mosser, an executive at a communications company who died in New Jersey on December 10, 1994. The third victim, Gilbert Brant Murray, who represented the interests of the lumber industry, also died in Sacramento on April 24. The other bombings resulted in victims losing fingers, hearing, vision, and suffering a range of other injuries, in addition to causing damage to property and personal belongings. Ted's primary targets were universities and companies linked to technology and aviation. The FBI managed to create a composite sketch of the suspect, but they were unsure if they were dealing with a single individual. Moreover, there was no certainty that the person seen leaving one of the packages was the same one who constructed the bombs. The investigation faced many obstacles. The forensic team struggled to collect any genetic material, hair, or fingerprints that could help identify the criminal. Although some fingerprints were found on at least one of the packages, they did not belong to Ted. He had deliberately planted them to mislead the FBI. Throughout these years, the FBI remained in the dark while the United States panicked every time a package arrived. With no suspects, the FBI coined the term Unabomber, derived from University and Airline Bomber, referencing the targets of his bombs, universities, and airlines. And so Ted, the solitary genius behind it all, received the nickname that would make him world-renowned. In 1995, after years of attacks and fear, Ted decided to speak out. He wrote his manifesto titled Industrial Society and Its Future, later referred to as the Unabomber Manifesto by the FBI. Ted sent the document demanding it be published in a major newspaper, promising to stop the attacks in exchange. Authorities convened, and after much discussion, the FBI decided to concede to his demand. I have proven that I can continue the attacks. Now, I want my message to be heard, Ted wrote in his letter to the FBI. Thus, the Washington Post published the manifesto on September 19, 1995. Ted's manifesto is an extensive work, around 35,000 words long, covering a range of complex topics. 
It begins by stating that the Industrial Revolution and its consequences were a disaster for humanity. For him, modern society had created a world where humans could no longer adapt naturally. Ted saw contact with nature as the solution to this problem, arguing that technology had turned us into slaves of an industrial system that prioritized the system itself over human freedom. This perspective fueled Ted's attacks. Through his bombs, he sought to violently alert the world to the dangers of technology and the dark future he envisioned for humanity. He believed that human behavior was being shaped to serve the system, where a person's worth was measured solely by their productivity within that structure. Ted did not view this as a political issue. He criticized both liberals and conservatives. One of the most striking points of his discourse was how psychological problems were not addressed at their core. Instead, he argued that people were medicated, like those on antidepressants, to endure discomforts that would be unbearable under normal circumstances. Ted believed that technological advancement was inevitable, as benefits like the internet and electricity were marketed as indispensable, becoming part of daily life and ultimately eroding individual freedom. He illustrated this with the automobile. What was once a luxury item now dictates how cities are designed, eliminating the pedestrian's freedom to navigate freely. Even public transportation, in his view, is a form of limitation, forcing people to adapt to imposed routes and schedules. We are free only until our actions affect the system. Beyond that, our freedom does not exist, but is partially permitted, Ted wrote. He also discussed how basic human needs like water, food, and shelter were made so easy to meet that people were pushed into endless activities and hobbies that never brought true happiness or fulfillment. Ted envisioned a future where artificial intelligence would govern society due to the increasing complexity of the system. Observing this part of the manifesto makes it clear that Ted projected his lack of personal goals and ambitions onto his ideas, making his discourse even more apocalyptic. While some of his criticisms of the system may seem appealing, it is essential to remember that his actions were acts of terrorism. He killed three innocent people and left others seriously injured, suffering permanent damage such as loss of vision and hearing. Ted also made it clear that he did not believe in reform. For him, there was only one way out, the complete destruction of the system. He attempted to justify his attacks by claiming that, in the future, the suffering caused by the growth of the system would be much greater. His goal was to start a revolution, bringing society back to the Stone Age, where, according to him, people could finally achieve true freedom and happiness through direct contact with nature. Despite his arguments, Ted's bombs never caused any significant change in the advancement of technology or society. Nevertheless, the name Unabomber still attracts a community that, in part, agrees with the ideas in the manifesto, although they profoundly condemn the violence of his actions. Ted became a cultural reference point, appearing in memes, books, films, series, and even on t-shirts. In some circles, there's even an ironic version where he is replaced by the character Garfield, especially among older members of this community. When the manifesto was published, the police hoped Ted would fulfill his promise and stop his attacks. However, what truly ended his violent trajectory was something different. What ultimately led to Ted's capture was his own brother, David Kaczynski. After reading the manifesto published in the newspaper, David recognized Ted's writing style and some quotes he commonly used. Concerned that his brother might be the Unabomber, he contacted the FBI, providing information that would lead to Ted's arrest. On April 3, 1996, Ted Kaczynski was finally apprehended, ending a string of attacks that lasted 17 years. Inside Ted's cabin, agents found a treasure trove of evidence, the original manuscripts of the manifesto, 40,000 pages of text that included detailed instructions on how to make bombs, along with his critiques of technology. There was also a ready-to-use bomb, making it clear he had no intention of stopping. Among other items, investigators found newspaper clippings about the Unabomber bomb components and a Bible with highlighted passages, including Psalm 23 in the first three chapters of John. The highlighted passages in Ted's Bible, like Psalm 23 in the first three chapters of John, carry profound messages. Psalm 23 speaks of trust and divine protection, with the famous verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Meanwhile, the early chapters of John explore the concept of light and truth, stating, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
These highlighted excerpts create an intriguing contrast with Ted's actions, especially considering he rejected modern society and was raised by atheist parents. David Kaczynski requested that his identity be kept confidential, but his name leaked to the press. Upon learning this, Ted vowed never to forgive his brother. During the trial, he refused to look at David, turning his back while his brother spoke. From that moment on, Ted referred to David as Judas Iscariot and never responded to any of his letters in prison. After his capture, Ted underwent another IQ test, scoring 136 still well above average. This test was conducted in a controlled environment by a mental health professional, making it likely more accurate than the previous one. His life had been marked by isolation and a sense of not belonging, common traits for people with exceptionally high intelligence. At various points in his life, Ted sought help for his mental health. For example, in 1988, he visited a psychiatrist and confessed his struggles with relationships. During that time, he attended several sessions, reporting issues such as insomnia and depression, but it is unclear if he received adequate care. What is evident is that Ted needed help but apparently never received the necessary support effectively. Ted's lawyers recommended that he plead insanity, a common tactic in serious cases. However, he rejected this strategy and requested to replace his defense team. Ted wanted Tony Serra, a lawyer known for his anti-establishment views, to take the case and use his anti-technology manifesto as a part of the defense. However, his request was denied. On January 7, 1998, after a suicide attempt, Ted Kaczynski underwent a mental health evaluation ordered by the judge. Psychiatrist Sel Johnson interviewed him for 22 hours, far exceeding the standard time for clinical examinations, which typically last between one and two and a half hours. The result was a 51-page report diagnosing him with schizophrenia, characterized by delusions, hallucinations, and loss of touch with reality. Although the schizophrenia diagnosis has been contested by other professionals over the years, the court upheld the original assessment. Nevertheless, even with the diagnosis, Ted was deemed mentally fit to stand trial and answer for his crimes. Ted was convicted for misuse of the mail, transportation and manufacturing of illegal explosives and three counts of first-degree murder. He received eight consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He was sent to the maximum security ADX prison in Colorado, home to other notorious terrorists, including those involved in the World Trade Center attacks and the Oklahoma City bombing. After his capture, the items found in Ted's cabin were auctioned off by the police. Bomb components and manufacturing plans were excluded from the auction, but the remaining items raised $15 million, distributed among the victims and their families. The cabin was dismantled and transported to FBI headquarters, where it remains on display. In March 2021, Ted was diagnosed with rectal cancer after reporting bleeding. He was transferred to the Federal Medical Center Butner in North Carolina, where he began chemotherapy. However, treatment was halted in March 2023 when the side effects outweighed the benefits. Facing a life sentence, he fell into depression and began receiving psychiatric support. The Unabomber had everything to pursue a promising path in any field he chose, but his hatred for technology and the system led him down a tragic road. Even if his manifesto resonates with some, his actions were brutal and took the lives of innocents whom he believed were part of the system he despised. The isolation and destructive thoughts nurtured within his cabin transformed him into an agent of destruction. On June 10, 2023, Ted Kaczynski was found unconscious in his cell after hanging himself with a shoelace. Despite efforts to revive him, he was declared dead at 8.07 a.m. in the hospital, thus ended the life of a man who, despite his brilliance, chose to use his genius to spread chaos and destruction. Ted Kaczynski passed away at 81, leaving behind a story marked by extremism and the complexities of the human mind. Now I want to know your opinion. Do you think in some way Ted Kaczynski's ideas in his manifesto still make sense today?